So let's get started. We'll start out uh, first with a question. Uh, which of the following dis best describes the mechanical axis of a normally aligned limb? Is it a vertical line from the femoral head to the center of the knee through the, to the center of the ankle? A valgus angle of five to seven degrees created by two lines drawn down the shaft of the femur and tibia? Is it a varus angle of three degrees created by two lines drawn down the shaft of the femur and tibia? A vertical line drawn from the femoral head passing 1.5 centimeters lateral to the center of the knee down to the center of the ankle? Or lastly, is it a vertical line drawn from the femoral head passing 1.5 centimeters medial to the center of the knee down to the center of the ankle? Well, I think probably most of you know that the correct answer is the mechanical axis is a vertical line drawn from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle. And as I'll actually talk about, it's truly to the center of the talus, which is typically about three to four millimeters medial to the center of the ankle. If we go ahead and start looking on alignment, there are many things to consider. We must preoperatively plan, particularly uh, to determine our angle of valgus resection, uh, how to implant the components properly, balance the ligaments, and it can certainly determine or play some role in our selection of prosthetic design. If we look at normal anatomy, and it is important to realize we're all not built the same, but on average, the articulation surface of the distal femur is about five to seven degrees of valgus, whereas the proximal tibia is about 87 degrees or two to three degrees of varus in the normal non-diseased knee. Certainly our goals in axial alignment are to restore mechanical alignment. In other words, we'd like to have that total knee aligned that when we draw the uh, mechanical axis from the center of the femoral head to the center of the talus, it's gonna pass through the middle of the knee. We also wanna restore the joint line, which is very important for all of our ligaments to perform at their, the way that they were designed. We need to balance ligaments, and it's important that we look at this both in flexion as well as in extension and we want to maintain a normal Q angle as this will help facilitate proper patellar tracking. What about radiographs in our preoperative evaluation? <clears throat> well, I'm sure all of us always get a standing AP and lateral of the affected knee. This provides for evaluation of the amount of joint space narrowing, collateral ligamentous insufficiency. Typically, if you have an angular <clears throat> deformity of the knee uh, and you have associated collateral insufficiency in a varus knee, you'll often see gapping of the lateral joint space or gapping of the medial joint space in excessive valgus deformities. Also, uh, the AP view will give you an idea of subluxation of the femur on the tibia, which is not uncommon in very chronic varus deformities or the presence of bone defects. If we look at standing full length radiographs, I must admit in my practice uh, living in Colorado, uh, there's a lot of people that get broken bones uh, skiing on our mountains. So I typically get a standing long leg film on every knee looking for any distant deformities. Uh, I don't think uh, all people go ahead and do this. It can certainly be helpful. Uh, as Dr. Bolanesi stated, when you measure the angle between the anatomic axis of the femur and the mechanical axis, it gives you an idea of what degree of valgus you want to make your distal femoral cut. And probably long leg films become mandatory if you have any known femoral or tibial deformities, particularly distant from the joint, retained hardware, or as I will mention in a few minutes, if you have people that are very tall or very short, because again, <clears throat> the, the, that angle between the anatomic and the femoral axes can change based on stature. Extension uh, and flexion lateral views can also be helpful, particularly if you do them in weight bearing. Uh, if you have a knee that you're worried about subtle PCL instability, 
if you get a weight-bearing lateral view in full extension and you see the contact is somewhat posterior, then you get a weight-bearing flexion lateral and the contact point is translating anteriorly. This is pathognomonic for PCL insufficiency. And also, lastly, a very important view is the sunrise or the merchant view. Uh, here again, this is very helpful to assess the patellofemoral joint, look at the tracking, looking for tilt, looking for subluxation of the patella, and also bone erosion in those that have patellofemoral arthritis. Let's again talk about the anatomic axis of the femur. And again, as you can see on the diagram in blue, this is the line that bisects the medullary canal of the femur. If you draw that line on a long leg film, it can give you some guidance as to where to place the entry point of your drill for the intramedullary femoral guide. Uh, if you do a lot of these, oftentimes the exit point of the uh, anatomic axis is slightly medial to the midpoint of the femur. If we look at the mechanical axis of the femur, again, this is the line from the femoral head center to where the anatomic axis meets the intercondylar notch. And obtaining a neutral mechanical axis of the femur, why do we do that? If we look at gait studies in the majority of people, if we go ahead and make that femoral cut perpendicular to that mechanical axis, it will help give more even load sharing between the medial and the lateral compartments. If we look at that valgus cut angle, I think uh, most of us are making a cut in five to seven degrees of, uh, of valgus relative to the anterior femoral axis. Um, again, as, as Dr. Bolognese has pointed out, you can, however, on a long leg film, measure the angle created by the anatomic and mechanical axes, and this can give you a rough idea of how much valgus angle you may want to cut. Remember that in people that are very tall, uh, typically that angle that you want to cut of valgus is actually less. Or if you have very short people, sometimes you may want to cut in a greater degree of valgus. Um, the other thing that you certainly can also look at is the femoral neck shaft angle. And if you have that dysplastic hip that has a neck shaft angle maybe of 150 degrees, you may want to actually cut your femur in only three to four degrees of valgus. Or should you have that very large male that has coxa vera, sometimes you're going to cut in the seven to eight degree range. But again, measuring that angle between the anatomic and mechanical axes can be helpful in giving you some guidance to go ahead and determine what valgus angle you are going to cut in. What about axial alignment of the tibia? Well, the anatomic axis of the tibia is that line that runs down the medullary canal of the tibia. And in general, if you're using a, a extramedullary or intramedullary guide, in general, you're trying to set the axis of the guide parallel with that anatomic axis. And if you draw this line out and you use an intramedullary tibial cutting guide, it can give you some guidance on where to make your entry point for this guide. If we look at the mechanical axis of the tibia, again, it is a line from the center of the proximal tibia to the center of the talus. And normally, the mechanical and the anatomic axes of the tibia are the same. And therefore, you can usually cut the tibia perpendicular to the anatomic axis of the tibia. However, if you have tibial uh, deformities, an old tibial diaphyseal fracture with malunion, those sort of things, then the mechanical and the anatomic axes are not the same. And usually when you have that situation, it is much wiser to go ahead and use an extramedullary tibial cutting guide. Let's talk about patellofemoral alignment. And here the Q angle is very important. Abnormal patellar tracking, while it is not probably the most devastating complication of knee arthroplasty, it has certainly been shown in the studies to be the most common. 
I think the most important variable in getting proper patellar tracking is try to preserve the normal Q angle. And this angle is defined by the angle created by the extensor mechanism axis, which runs from the anterior superior leg spine to the center of the patella and the axis of the patellar tendon. We know that any increase in Q angle will lead to an increased lateral force vector on the patella, risking lateral subluxation. Obviously, a laterally sublux patella is associated with many adverse things, including increased anterior knee pain, chronic effusion, accelerated, accelerated wear of the polyethylene button, um, uh, to name a few. It is critical to realize the errors that can lead to an increased Q angle and patellofemoral tracking problems. And the four things that are listed here below, those four bullets, you're going to hear them over and over in the remaining portion of my presentation. Certainly, what will increase the Q angle is if you internally rotate or medialize the femoral component, internally rotate the tibial component, or you actually error in placing the patellar component lateral on the surface of the patella. Joint line preservation is important. And certainly, our goal is to restore the joint line by inserting a prosthesis that's going to be of similar thickness as the bone and cartilage that you're going to remove. This helps to facilitate retaining proper ligament tension. And if there are bone defects, it's important that <clears throat> these must be addressed so you don't over-resect and disrupt the joint line. And we know that elevating of the joint line has a lot of adverse effects. It can affect motion. It can affect instability, particularly in mid-flexion. It can lead to patellofemoral tracking problems, patellar baja. <clears throat> and if you look at the little targets on the right, it has been shown that maintaining the joint line, you must be probably a bit more precise if you're doing a posterior cruciate retaining than a substituting knee. If you look at the work of Cliff Caldwell, he has shown if you save the posterior cruciate ligament and elevate the joint line more than three to four millimeters, you end up having problems with both knee stiffness as well as instability, whereas some of the historic data provided by Harry Figge has shown probably adverse effects do not occur with a poster stabilized type of knee unless you elevate the joint more than uh, eight millimeters. Also, if you lower the joint line by going ahead and maybe under-resect the femur, this can lead to flexion contracture, but also flexion instability, which I'll discuss later. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.